Hi, I'm Martin Kenny. I volunteer at the Old Low Light Heritage Centre and from where I'll lead guided walks and give occasional talks. On my walk we take in the view from Collingwood's monument and pause for a few minutes to talk about the great man and his monument. I don't profess to be as informative as the special interest group, the Collingwood Society, but I strongly recommend them to any of you who wish to know more about the man Cuthbert. He was born on the 26th of September 1748 at 86 The Side, Newcastle upon Tyne, the eighth of ten children, to Cuthbert Collingwood, a trader, and Milker Collingwood, nay Dobson. He passed away on the 7th of March 1810 on HMS Ville de Paris off the island of Menorca, whilst on passage back to England. It's believed he died of cancer. It had been seven years since he departed his home in Morpeth. In his early life he was a pupil of the RGS, the Royal Grammar School, Newcastle upon Tyne, until the age of 12 years, at which point along with his younger brother Wilfred he volunteered to join the Royal Navy and in 1761 sailed out of the Tyne on HMS Shannon, a 28-gun frigate under the command and patronage of his cousin Captain Richard Braithwaite, sometimes known as Brathwaite. This was known as following, where you had a member of the family, perhaps a relation, who you followed and became your mentor during your first few years at sea. In 1766 he was rated as a midshipman and studied as an apprentice prior to taking his lieutenant's exam. In 1762 he transferred to the 20-gun frigate HMS Gibraltar with his brother Wilfred, his maternal cousin Captain Richard Braithwaite once again in command. This ship served in home waters, the Atlantic and latterly the Mediterranean. In 1767 he joined the newly recommissioned 28-gun frigate HMS Liverpool, still following Braithwaite. During the next five years he saw service in Newfoundland, two years, and thence the Mediterranean, remaining there until returning for payoff in Chatham, England in 1772. He was now rated as master's mate, a position meaning to assist the master of the vessel, usually given to a midshipman not yet eligible for promotion to lieutenant. In 1772, at the age of 24, now without his patron, Captain Braithwaite, but still with his brother Wilfred, he transferred to HMS Lenox in Portsmouth Harbour. His new captain was a fellow Northumbrian by name of Robert Rodham, born at Rodham Hall near Wooler. HMS Lenox was a guardship, so called to guard a particular port and be ready at short notice, say two days, to proceed to sea if war broke out. This was unlike the majority of RN warships, which were decommissioned in peacetime and would have taken weeks or months to become battle ready. This was a short-lived period. He was soon on the move again, joining the 50-gun ship HMS Portland and sailing to the West Indies. HMS Portland was virtually new ship completed in 1770. In the West Indies, Cuthbert met Horatio Nelson. Cuthbert was 25 years of age and Horatio 15 years of age. Nelson was employed as a midshipman on the merchantman Mary Ann under the command of a Captain Rathbone. On arrival in the West Indies, Cuthbert was transferred to the 80-gun ship HMS Princess Amelia, built as HMS Norfolk in 1751, his largest ship so far. They patrolled the east coast of America before returning to England in late 1773 and moving berth to the 50-gun HMS Preston under the command of Captain Evelyn Sutton, still serving as master's mate. He was 27 years of age when he gained promotion to the rank of lieutenant following his conduct ashore at the Battle of Bunker's Hill, where he fought with a body of seamen. The Battle of Bunker Hill was fought on the June the 17th, 1775, during the Siege of Boston in the early stages of the American War of Independence. In 1776 he took passage on the 64-gun HMS Somerset, returning to England and hoping to be promoted to full lieutenant, which was confirmed. HMS Somerset had also played her part in the Battle of Bunker Hill, but unfortunately finished her days wrecked on a sandbar off Provincetown, Cape Cod. Lieutenant Collingwood remained in London, seeking a ship, and his patience paid off. He was appointed to HMS Hornet, a 14-gun sloop, and sent to the West Indies. Sloops were relatively small vessels with two masts and a single deck of guns. For the next four years, Lieutenant Collingwood served on Her Majesty's ships Lowestoft, Bristol and Badger. This was during the American War of Independence when captains were encouraged to take prizes of American and latterly French ships. This could be highly rewarding and prize money could amount to two, three or even four times their annual pay. 
In 1780, Horatio Nelson was post-captain, or captain, in HMS Hinchinbroke, when he suffered illness, possibly a recurrence of malaria, which he was prone to, and was sent home on HMS line to recuperate. Fortuitously for Lieutenant Collingwood, this left a vacancy, and he replaced Nelson on HMS Hinchinbroke as post-captain, where he served for the following two years. It was now 19 years since the 12-year-old Cuthbert had left Newcastle and sailed out of the Tyne. In 1782 he returned to England hoping for another posting, and in 1783 he was granted captaincy of his HMS Mediator, a 44-gun frigate, and sailed to the West Indies again. Meanwhile his brother Wilfred Collingwood had likewise been promoted lieutenant in 1778, and was soon to be promoted again to commander in 1783. Wilfred died at sea from tuberculosis off the island of Grenada on the 21st of April 1787, and was buried in a military ceremony on St Vincent. His father, Cuthbert Collingwood, died in 1775, and his mother Milka died in 1788. On returning to England in 1786, he failed to find another ship, and returned home to Newcastle to spend the next four years, where he discovered romance in the name of one Sarah Blackett. Sarah was the first of four children born to Father John Erasmus Blackett, one-time mayor of Newcastle, and mother Sarah Rodham no relation to Captain Robert Rodham of HMS Lenox. They had reached an understanding, which meant they wished to be married. Captain Collingwood was probably on half pay and needed money as a serving captain. He returned to London trying to find a ship. He must have been torn between marriage and career, but nevertheless he joined the 30 Dugon HMS Mermaid and took passage to the West Indies this time in response to a political and economic dispute between Spain, Great Britain and the USA, the so-called Nootka Crisis. This being resolved diplomatically, HMS Mermaid was instructed to return to Portsmouth and after undergoing repairs paid off in June 1791, allowing Captain Collingwood to return home to Newcastle. On the 16th of June 1791, Cuthbert Collingwood, aged 35, is recorded as having married Sarah Blackett, aged 26, at St Nicholas Cathedral, Newcastle. They rented a house in Morpeth, which became the family home and was purchased in 1801. It's a Grade II listed building and situated in Oldgate. It's not open to the public, but you can walk past it and you can read the plaque on the wall. The first child of Sarah and Cuthbert was born on the 28th of June, 1792, and baptised Sarah Collingwood, known affectionately as Little Sal. On the 19th of July 1792 at St John's Church, Newcastle, the second to arrive on the scene was Mary Patience on August the 13th 1793. They had no further recorded children. In the following seven years he served on HMS Prince, Barfleur and Excellent, gaining the post of Flag Captain to Rear Admiral George Bowyer on the Prince. He received gold medals for his actions on HMS Barfleur during the first naval battle of the French Revolution, the so-called glorious 1st of June and for the Battle of St Vincent in the Napoleonic War, where he came to the aid of Nelson, who, on HMS Captain, had been surrounded by five Spanish ships. In 1799 he returned to his home in Morpeth, during which time he was promoted to Rear Admiral of the White. A Rear Admiral being placed in rank above Captain, or Commander, but below a Vice Admiral, who in turn is below Admiral. The White simply means a Royal Navy Squadron of that colour. There were three colours, red, white and blue, and that was their order of seniority. Each colour had an Admiral, Vice Admiral and Rear Admiral. The Admiral of the Fleet was the most senior and he had no colour and was Admiral of the Fleet for life. The three colours later became the flags of the Merchant Navy, Royal Navy and the Royal Naval Reserve respectively. The following two years were spent on HMS Triumph and HMS Barfleur blockading the French fleet in Brest and other Biscay ports. His home port at this time was Plymouth, and during this period his wife and little Sal came to visit him. The French Revolutionary War ended in 1802 with the signing of the Treaty of Amiens, but was soon followed by the Napoleonic Wars. The temporary cessation of hostilities allowed Cuthbert to return home to Morpeth and relax, taking his dog Bounce for walks and scattering acorns as he went, with the view that England would never be short of oak to build her ships. This was a short-lived time of peace. Napoleon had his eye on the invasion of the United Kingdom and in 1803 war was declared with France. Rear Admiral Collingwood departed Morpeth, never to return. The blockade of the French ports resumed whilst Napoleon was building his forces 
Napoleon needed control of the English Channel to mount an invasion of the United Kingdom, and he hoped to achieve this by using the combined might of the French and Spanish fleets to defeat the British fleet. In 1804, Cuthbert Colling was promoted to Vice Admiral of the Blue, and was placed in control of the blockade of Cadiz, where the French and Spanish fleets were holed up. The build-up to the Battle of Trafalgar started in early 1805, when the French fleet, under command of Vice Admiral Villeneuve, having escaped Nelson's blockade of Toulon, were chased to the Caribbean and back via Ferrol in northern Spain and finally to Cadiz. And so it was that on the 16th of September, Napoleon gave orders for the combined Franco-Spanish fleet to proceed to the Mediterranean to attack Naples, to divert the Australian, Austrian army with whom he was now at war. Admiral Villeneuve and his captains received word that Nelson was at sea off Cadiz, and they voted to stay in harbour. But, being stung by the very real threat by Napoleon that he would be replaced by Vice Admiral Francoise Rosalie, he proceeded to sea on the 20th of October. Nelson had held dinner parties for his captains on board HMS Victory in the three weeks leading up to the battle. His plan had been discussed and explained so there would be no doubt as to how to progress it. But the one proviso that in case of missed signals, no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of the enemy. His plan was to form his fleet into two columns. He would lead the northerly in HMS Victory, and his good friend, Vice Admiral Cuthbert Collingwood, would lead the southerly in HMS Royal Sovereign. They would sail directly at the Franco-Spanish fleet and cut it into three sections. The story of the whole battle is beyond the scope of this talk, and can be found in many notable books. But, at dawn on the 21st of October, the fleets were in sight of each other, HMS Royal Sovereign was gradually drawing ahead of the rest of the fleet, being slightly faster, having had her hull recently resheathed in copper to prevent the boring worms. Because of the angle of attack, she had to absorb heavy fire before her own guns came to bear. Her first double shot at broadside, as she passed the stern of the Spanish flagship Santa Ana, was devastating, causing Nelson to exclaim, See how that noble fellow Collingwood takes his ship into action. And separately, for Collingwood to exclaim, what would Nelson give to be here? Collingwood sustained the sea fight for upwards of an hour, before the next English ship entered the fray. The first shots came from the French 74-gun ship of the line, Fugo, at approximately 11.50. HMS Victory began firing shortly after midday. Admiral Horatio Nelson was fatally wounded by a musket ball at 13.15 and died at 16.30. Vice Admiral Collingwood became the commander of the English fleet, but Royal Sovereign was by now badly damaged and unable to manoeuvre. Collingwood transferred his flag to the frigate Euryalus to control the ongoing battle. The battle ended at 1715. Eighteen enemy ships had been captured, four fled, although they were captured a few weeks later, and eleven managed to make it to Cadiz. No English ships were lost. Some 450 British sailors were killed and 1,200 wounded. French and Spanish losses were heavier, 4,400 dead, 2,500 wounded and 20,000 taken prisoner. These figures are approximations. Vice Admiral Collingwood was ennobled on his return to England as Baron Collingwood of Coldburn and Hethpool. He was promoted to Vice Admiral of the Red and made Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet, which was from the southern tip of Portugal to the Dardanelles. He may not have been impressed by his ennoblement and is reported to have said, and so I have a great barony. It may be called a barony to me, meaning fruitless. Value 30 shillings a year or thereabouts. But if I live long enough, I will make it a place of consideration. These were fateful words. It would be difficult to eclipse Horatio Nelson's feet at Trafalgar, and he didn't, because he was so successful at keeping the French and the Spanish navies bottled up. Collingwood's health began a slow decline from the time he became Commander-in-Chief in the Mediterranean. He asked the Admiralty to be relieved several times, but this was never granted. He had a property in Menorca, which became his infrequently used shore base. He spent most of his time at sea. The house is on the south side of the Port Mahon, and is now the Hotel Almoranti. He was much admired by his crews, who frequently referred to him as father. He disagreed with impressment, or press gangs, and flogging, but instead made use of a withering stare, which seemed to have the greater effect. He tried to lure the French and Spanish navies out of port, but with no success. Once bitten, twice shy. In 1809 he had command of his final ship, HMS Ville de Paris, 
a 100-gun first-rate ship of the line. By the 3rd of March 1810, his worsening health forced him to hand over his command of the Mediterranean to fleet to Rear Admiral Martin. Collingwood died on the evening of the 7th of March 1810 before he reached England. He was laid in state at the Painted Hall in Greenwich and buried in St Paul's Cathedral, close to the tomb of his friend Nelson. Collingwood had no male heir, so his peerage became extinct. He's fondly remembered by the northeast of England. His statue, designed by J.G. Loff, and the plinth designed by John Dobson, stands at Tymouth, overlooking the mouth of the River Tyne. There are four 32-pounder flintlock cannons either side of the steps. These were saved for this purpose when the Royal Sovereign was broken up in 1841. The monument is 1845. Rumours abound regarding the direction he's looking, some say towards Trafalgar, others say his position so that he can be seen both from the sea and from the shields. Next time you visit the monument, try and find the sculptor's mistake with the cable laid rope. It's at the back of the monument. Well, I hope you enjoyed my brief take on the life of Lord Collingwood. Thank you for listening.